Good evening, and welcome to another special edition of ONV, our Neutral Voices podcast. Today, I get the pleasure of speaking with Aisha Arrington from the Fort Wayne Urban League, and she's going to sit down and talk to us a little bit about the race car project that they have going on, and as well as get us up to date and let us know about what's going on at the Fort Wayne Urban League. Aisha, how are you doing? It's a oh. pleasure having you today. Oh, good. Thank you. I just really thank you for inviting me out tonight and um, to talk about this special project that the Urban League has going on right now. All righty. Now, look, before we get off into it, I think I told you a little off air. People, mm -hmm. you know, Fort Wayne, we're a big little city, as I like to call it. And you've been the director of Urban League for how long? Uh, 18 months. 18 months. There you go. A, a fresh 18 months. And people ask me all the time, hey, do you know the director? You know, who is she? Where's she come from? <laughs> so I'm going to give you the floor, let the people know who you are and how you got there. Tell a little bit about your story. Um, sure. Well, Aisha Arrington, born and raised Fort Wayne, so I'm homegrown here. Um, I did grow up in the foster care system here locally, so I moved around a lot, attended a lot of different schools. Um, but I am a graduate of Purdue Fort Wayne here locally. I did get my master's degree from Indiana Tech. Um, some people recognize my face and voice maybe because I participated in Indiana Tech's Go For It campaign, had a billboard and commercial that came on right before games. So if you're a football watcher, a basketball watcher, you may have uh, heard a little bit about me. Um, but anyway, because I've, I've lived here um, all my life, all of my uh, professional career has been here. So non-for-profit is really uh, my backbone of experience. I worked for aging and in-home services here locally for about eight years. Um, I worked with healthier moms and babies for about two years when I was an undergrad. And then um, I worked for the Ombudsman program for 14 and a half years and was their executive director uh, for 12 and a half years of that time. Ombudsman is one of those words that you don't hear every day, uh, but much of my work with that organization was uh, advocating for people that lived in nursing homes. So uh, people in the community recognized me as, as that too, because if they had a loved one in a nursing home that they felt like wasn't getting proper care, they would reach out to me um, as an advocate to help them along uh, their journey. So uh, when I joined uh, Fort Wayne Urban League 18 months ago, I really did consider it like my dream job. Um, I, just because of my background and where I come from, I really understand that if we have strong programming um, and services where we're really offering people an opportunity, a chance to turn their life around or have the resources that they need to be successful, I'm all about that because that's where I you know come from um, my senior year in high school I found myself pregnant and when I turned 18 became homeless because when you're in foster care and you turn 18 there's nowhere for you to go um, I was fortunate to uh, be accepted in the YWCA self-sufficiency program at that time um, they took my daughter and I in for two years uh, that's where I um, uh, graduated with my GED during that time and then started taking classes at IPFW when it was called IPFW <laughs> um, so that's just one example of how um, you you know programming has helped me services have helped me and that's really where my heart is I just want to give back to the community um, and bring the Urban League back to the community Wow that is awesome I mean you are a true testament and uh, just sitting here listening here in your story I mean, who better to run the Urban League than just like what you just described, somebody that's been through it, you know how to navigate, somebody that's got, you know, that's caring and compassionate. Um, you check all the boxes in my book. So, I mean, <laughs> it truly is honored. I didn't even know half of that stuff. So yes. it's good, you know, getting to sit here and uh, getting to know you. Um, you talked about programming. What kind of programming do you guys have going on at the Urban League right now? Well, before I answer that, JJ, I just really want to remind the community that Fort Wayne Urban League has been in the community for 104 years this year. Uh, we began in 1920. People sometimes don't know why. <laughs> why did the Urban League begin? Um, you know, we had a lot of African American people fleeing the South, coming to northern states, looking for jobs, looking for housing, looking for opportunities. Why were they fleeing? Jim Crow, 
lynching, uh, racial injustice. And so uh, when we talk about that, unfortunately, an urban league is still very much needed in the community because when we look at the data, um, the 2022 State of Black America's report states that African American people receive 73.9% of what white Americans receive. And so when we're talking about what they're receiving, it's looking at everything, housing, uh, pay rate, um, their ability for uh, loans to buy a home, wealth. Um, and so if we're only at 73.9%, we've got some room to grow. Um, so thinking about that, um, the Fort Wayne Urban League is one of 92 other affiliates across this country. And uh, just within the last year, uh, Fort Wayne Urban League has created four pillars of concentration. And those include uh, neighborhoods, social advocacy, education opportunities, and civic engagement. Um, traditionally, uh, uh, housing and employment are always pillars of the Urban League, so those are two things that we'll always be trying to explore and figure out how we can bring those services to an Urban League. Specifically with housing, when we think about that and think of wealth, that's really the great divider between an African American family and a white family. White family owns their home. Black families, if they're renting, they, that that's the, the divide there in wealth, and so we have to figure out how to get our community to to be buying homes because that's how we break through some of those barriers. Um, so when we look at our four pillars, um, I've just got 18 months under my belt, so I do have a story to tell as far as what we did in that first year that I was with the Urban League. Uh, we were able to receive grant dollars from Seed Fort Wayne, and we provided $1,000 grants to eight southeast side blocks where they received $1,000 to beautify their block any way they wanted. Neighbors worked together to mulch, put flowers on the porch, solar walking lighting paths, reeves on the door. It was really fun, really way to just bring neighbors together and work together. Uh, we also had a senior techie program where seniors received a free Amazon Fire tablet, and then we taught them all things technology. So using apps, setting up an email. Um, the most uh, favorite thing was downloading the Bible to the tablet. So <laughs> overall, everyone really loved that. Uh, we also began a one-on-one -on -one tutoring program for area youth. Um, that's really important that we we spend a, just a moment talking about that because when I did my research coming into the Urban League, I wanted to be careful that we just didn't redo what everyone else in the community is doing. There's a lot of after-school programming here in the community, great after-school programming. But when you look at at, uh, black and brown children and how far behind they are academically with fundamentals, we know that after school programming isn't going to solve the problem. They really need a one on one tutoring. And isn't that what families do that have means? If you have a kid that's struggling in school and they're not doing well, you find a tutor, you take them to the tutor so that you can increase their skill. Um, so that's one thing that uh, we're offering at the Urban League. Uh, kids can receive two hours. Uh, one, uh, two hours every week with a certified teacher uh, to work on some of those fundamental uh, skills. We also had a partnership just recently with the Fort Wayne Civic Theater, and we were able to uh, offer free acting and art classes um, on campus. We're going to do that again here in a few more weeks. Uh, we're partnering with area artists so that they can come in and work with some of our youth on some of um, their, their art projects. We had a Meet the Camp candidates night at the Urban League. It was standing room only. Uh, we'll have another meet the candidates night um, here again this year. I think voter turn turnout this year was like 12, 13 percent of all eligible yeah. voters voted. <laughs> um, so but the, but in order to get people to vote, you have to engage them. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the people that we serve through the Urban League feel like their voice doesn't matter. Um, their vote isn't going to change anything. And so we have to really work hard at changing 
changing that perception. You know, we as black people worked so hard to have the right to vote, you know, in 1965. And so, you know, we've got to encourage people to register to vote and then get out to the polls and put their vote in. Um, so that's something that we did. So, you know, it's a lot of community work. We had a trunk or treat at the Urban League. Halloween night served over 200 kids that could walk over to the Urban League and safely trick or treat and not have to worry about a ride across town somewhere. Uh, we serve them right there um, in the community. So we're continuing to grow, um, but those are just a couple of the highlights that, that we've accomplished. Okay. Hey, awesome and definitely uh, needed. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I mean, it's kids all over this city from student athletes to littles. How, how does somebody get involved with the one-on-one -on -one tutoring? Um, they simply just have to call the Urban League. We have spots available now. Call us and we can get you registered. Um, and that two hours a week really makes a difference. We have a young lady that started with us in October um, and, and was probably a little behind in writing skill and vocabulary. And uh, she wrote an essay for school recently and it got chosen as one of the best essays. Yeah, wow. You know, so there's power in a kid being able to sit down and have one on one attention with um, a teacher. Sure. Some of the kids that came to us for the one-on-one -on -one tutoring participated in our STEAM camp last summer. Uh, we're bringing that back again. What makes ours a little different is that all the kids that participate in STEAM camp earn a $100 Visa card. So there's a motivation there to get all of their science and math um, work done so that they can get a certificate of completion and then earn that $100. Gotcha. Now, how has the uh, turnout been? Because, I mean, you got free tutoring. It, it, they ought to be uh, kicking the doors in. You ought yeah. to be turning people away. So <laughs> well, I have to It's not ask. as busy as we would want, JJ. Yeah. That's a great question. We have 37 kids right now um, signed up and actively getting um, their tutoring sessions, but we have room to grow. Okay. So Follinger Foundation uh, granted Urban League um, a grant for 2024 in the amount of 30000 and part of that funding is helping to support the tutoring program. The city of Fort Wayne uh, gave us monies through CDBG to start the tutoring tutoring program so we want to add another tutor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to get more kids in, enrolled okay and what, what's what's the grade ranges are we talking elementary are we talking high school is there stipulations the, um, I just looked at um, some of our numbers and 80% of the kids are third grade through 10th grade but we take any kid in grade school so from kindergarten through 12th grade they're more than welcome to come and get those uh, two hours of tutoring we have a little kindergartner um, that really just needed help with writing and so holding a pencil correctly and being able to write his name and practicing that one-on-one -on -one, um, has really made a difference and I think when you just look at education you know the teachers have a lot lot of pressure on them when you've got 30 plus kids and we know some of those kids in the classroom have special needs it's impossible to address all of the kids needs and so for me I'm just really passionate about growing that one-on-one -on -one tutoring program because I know it can make a really big difference yeah I gotcha I mean you said it in the beginning I mean you know families with that have the means uh, that's the first thing they do is you struggle you get somebody to a tutor. Yeah. Now, here you guys are offering free tutoring. I'm going to look right here in this camera and say, hey, we need to bust them <laughs> at the seams. I, I know, you know, the kids that I work with, the grades, these kids need help. And here they are offering for free. I want that after-school program, that one-on-one -on -one tutoring to blow up after this interview because there's no reason we shouldn't be taking advantage of that. Yeah. You know, a program like that, if you moved it and put it in uh, different communities, mm -hmm. You know, it would be just that. People would yeah. break their necks to get over oh, there. Yeah. And, you know, and I know that's one of the biggest uh, frustrations, if I do sound elevated, mm -hmm. because, you know, when, when programs are put in place, people don't take advantage. Mm -hmm. So we need to be taking advantage of that program. Yeah. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. Sure. And we're going to talk uh, the race car project. You know, you sent me that email. I filled out my card and I said, man, this is this is awesome. Mm -hmm. Explain to the audience a little bit. Tell them about what the race car project is. Well, just to remind everyone, social advocacy is one of the Fort Wayne Urban League's pillars. And so we're always looking for ways that we can be a social advocate. Um, I was fortunate during uh, the holiday time to have six full days off of the Urban League um, to sit at home and think about what I wanted 2024 to look like. Um, so as I was planning out um, our calendar, I was thinking, gosh, Black History Month is going to be here before you know it. What are we going to do? 
do. Um, I've really been intentional about not just reinventing the wheel. I didn't want another breakfast, another brunch, another luncheon, um, because it's kind of one and done. And then, yes, it can be inspiring and encouraging at the time, but then how does it move the needle a little? Um, I was introduced to uh, the race card project a year ago uh, when Catherine Hill with PNC, who also sits on our board, invited me to hear journalist Michelle Norris talk about how she created the race card project in 2010. And so when I was thinking about a black history project, a light bulb went off and I said, what if Fort Wayne Urban League partnered with the race card project for the entire month of February and challenged people to give us their race story in six words. So I took a brave moment and emailed uh, Michelle Norris's team, uh, introducing myself, talking a little bit about the Urban League and how we love to partner with them. Um, two weeks passed and no one responded. And I said, oh, well, I tried. Maybe we won't hear anything. And then I get a call. And they were excited about partnering with us, very encouraging, and, and gave us the green light to go. So uh, we were able to get their postcard here. <laughs> um, and. Uh, put Urban League's logo on it. And so we had a press conference uh, February 1st. We invited community leaders um, to give us their six word race story so uh, people would understand what it looked like. So I stepped to the mic and, um, you know, thanked everyone for coming. And then uh, leaders in the community behind me stepped up to the mic and gave their six words. Uh, so we had people like Amos Norman with Ren Point Y, Danita Washington. We had board members members like Rachel Tobin Smith and John Rogers um, coming to the mic um, and sharing their six words. It was really powerful. Um, if anybody wants to look at that press conference, it's on the Fort Wayne Urban League's website at www.fwul.org, and you can listen to the press conference there. So uh, we created uh, community partners. Uh, we had three YMCA locations and three Allen County Public Library locations where we had the race card available, where someone could give us their six words, drop it in a box. Then we had electronic submissions, like what you gave us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking the time to do that, um, where you could submit your six words online. And then we created a race card wall on the Urban League's website so that people can see what folks are submitting. And um, it's really cracked open um, a conversation here in the community about what race really means to people. Gotcha. And that, and that was the goal uh, setting out with this project? Is this... It was the goal. I, I think uh, we can't really dance around um, the climate of, of race in our community. We have a very important election coming up. Uh, we have a lot of things that race affects. And I don't think until we have really honest conversations about why we are where we are, um, that we can really move forward. Uh, one of my... Um, uh, uh, folks that I really love in this kind of work is Brian Stevenson. Of course, he's an author that wrote Just Mercy um, that was turned into a, a movie. Um, but but he, he made a point one time in one of his interviews where he said, you know, the big problem with race, um, especially with African American people in this country, is that we never really received an apology. We never got and I'm sorry. Um, and, and that really just always hit me. Because I'm a mom. You know, when my kids are arguing, you separate them. You know, what's the first thing you do? Apologize. And even yeah. if it's a half apology, I'm sorry. You accept it, you know, but then you're able to move on. How can we ever move on if we never really get an apology? I'm sorry. This shouldn't have happened. That kind of an acknowledgement. Um, will we get a I'm sorry from the race card project? No. But it's a way for people to talk about some of the pain, the hurt, um, and there's joy in that too. Uh, for me, I did brace myself because obviously I knew opening this up um, in Fort Wayne that all the comments weren't going to be positive, um, and I knew that I'd have to, you know, be able to deal with the, the ugly stuff that came in too, and we have gotten ugly comments. You know, there's things that we couldn't put up on uh, the website because it was violent in nature, um, but 
But I have to tell you, JJ, I've been called the N word more times in the past three weeks than ever in my whole entire life. Wow. You know, because they find my name, they find me in social media, and then I have horrible comments in my inbox. But if I had the choice of uh, doing this again, I would do it again because I think the conversation is so necessary. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you said something. Um, you talked about never having an apology. And the first thing that came to my mind is why would there be an apology? There's some people that yeah. said there's no pro no problems, there's yes. no issues. Yes. And you do a project labeled race card mm -hmm. project. There are people that literally look at that, don't have to know anything what it's mm -hmm. about, and come up, why do we got to talk about that? Why, yes. why do you have to divide? That's divisive. You hear these type of things. Yes. One of the things I wanted to ask you, you're at the Urban League now. Yes. How do you handle uh, comments um, like, uh, there's no need for organizations like the Urban League anymore? Well, we talked about that 73.9% earlier, right? So Correct. we know that we've got numbers to support what, what we're doing. Um, but when we talk about racism, um, that's something that's measurable. You know, when we don't have um, the, the home buying power that's measurable, when neighborhoods were redlined, and there's a reason why African American people are living in poorer areas at higher rates than other folks, that's measurable. Um, so I just think that's, you know, important to acknowledge. Yes, it's difficult for me um, to deal with some of the, the ugly comments, but, you know, we, we do this work because we're trying to move the needle a little. We're trying to make it better for our kids. I've got kids. I want us to be able, you know, to do better. So what was important to me was just simply opening up the conversation and giving everyone a chance to really share how they felt. Um, the flip side of it is there were some really inspirational stories told. Um, there was uh, one lady that had submitted her six words, but a story attached to it. And she talked about how she was a white female here in town and um, a group of boys went to the movie theater. Um, her son was one of the group of boys, um, but one of the boys was a black boy. And the boys got caught skipping movies. Ever done that? I've done Everybody, that. I was going to say. Okay, <laughs> they got caught. Um, the white boys were able to pull out their cell phones, call their parents right away, have the parents come pick them up, you know, no problem. But the but the black boy got, you know, way more questioned, couldn't pull out his cell phone there in the theater, had to stand outside in the rain, you know, to call for help, to say that he was there and having trouble. You and I, JJ, know that this happens every day, but when you have community members that don't necessarily have to deal with those kinds of things or hear about those kind of stories on a daily basis, I think it, it helps, you know, because now we have an ally who understands that what we're talking about isn't something where we're trying to stir the pot or create problems. This is real life affecting real people and their and, and the lives that they're living. Exactly right. That's funny because I, I tell people all the time uh, when you get you get a say a Caucasian family adopt somebody of color that, you know, that live their life or grew up thinking things were one way, but then they have a child of color that's in their home. Now they get to see a whole bunch of different things going on, just like that story you just told. You know, they don't see it until it literally is in, you know, in their home. Yeah. Or, you know, you've got friends. They got, you know, they're looking at their friends. They don't, they don't I ain't going to say see color, but they're hanging out with somebody of a different race. And then somebody else comes up and is handling them a, a whole lot different. Um, so, yes, that, that, that is very, uh, very interesting. Um, how do you see, uh, uh, really, just summarize Black History Month in Fort Wayne, uh, or really f formalize it or uh, summarize it nationally, and then break it down for me in Fort Wayne? Well, I think Black History Month is really black history every month of the year. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important that, that we have um, the discussion because there, we're, we're raising kids that don't understand some of the black history that even you and I grew up, you know, um, learning about. And so when we've got kids who don't really understand Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. uh, I, you, come on, we, we've got to have the conversation. When we have children that don't understand 
all the advances that that black people brought, you know, th things that we created, um, that's a problem. Um, and so I, I think it's great that we have Black History Month, but I think it's something that has to be ongoing so that we're learning about our history. Um, another project that uh, Urban League did last year is that um, we created a banned book campaign here in town. I bring that up because we're talking about black history. A lot of the books nationally that are being banned are by black authors or black themes. And so we were really intentional about buying some of those books and passing them out to the community for free. We almost made 600 books that we passed out for free. But the point is, JJ, a lot of those titles you just wouldn't believe. I mean, I know why The Caged Bird Sings by Dr. Maya Angelou is on a banned book list. Wow. The, you know, The blue, the Bluest Eye, uh, Ruby Bridges Goes to School. And when Ruby Bridges asked in, in, a, in an interview, why is my book being banned? She was told it would make uh, white children feel bad about themselves. Ruby Bridges is still alive. Wow. She lived that history of integrating that all white school in New Orleans, uh, you know, and now she can't share her story when this happened in real time. Um, so I, I just think it's really important that we just keep the conversation going and so that we're not silenced because black history matters. What we contributed to um, this country matters, and we have to keep saying it loud. Yeah. I got two things off that. A, people talk about just what you just said um and that's including african-americans that say they don't believe in black history month mm -hmm. because it is just mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. but if history isn't being taught what do you do but actually that leads into my second question that i really i wanted to ask you um the banned books is one uh, indication or one example but when you see stuff getting overturned that organizations like the urban league and the naacp fought so hard to get and now these things are getting overturned yes um you know talk to that speak to that point it's i mean it's you can't say it's not disappointing you can't say that it's not heavy because it is um but people who work in the movement fort wayne urban leaguers you know call ourselves working in the movement you worked at an <laughs> urban league so you're an urban leaguer for life jj yeah. uh we're a part of that movement and you know people like dr martin luther king and malcolm x and so many people um that were in that movement trying to make uh, life better for for black people didn't have easy times and we have to remember that you know dr martin luther king um did a lot with with getting things passed like the 1965 uh, voting rights act but you know what happened after that when he noticed that listen i can't just do all civil rights if we're not talking about poverty because they go hand in hand when he wanted to really focus on poverty he got so much pushback um you, you know he arrived in a chicago slum one time in a building that had no heat they were rustling around trying to get the heat turned on babies were being brought to him wrapped in newspaper because it was so cold he made a call to the president and said listen we, we've got to do something over here there's going to be a riot here in this the Chicago city because we we th this poverty is so overwhelming to the people that it's affecting we've got to get them some help and um, in a private conversation with someone he said you know the Civil Rights um, Act the Voting Rights Act didn't cost the country anything but if we really start uh, pushing back on poverty it's going to cost us something and I think about that with my role with the Fort Wayne Urban League it's the same thing it's going to cost the city something it's going to cost the community something if we really want to put dollars in programming um, and supports for those that that we're trying to break the barriers and get through all the disparities that are holding people back it's going to cost something that's scary. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And I was going to ask, I mean, how is it navigating the waters here in Fort Wayne? You're 18 months in, um, and you're talking about what, is, what it uh, is going to cost. Um, summarize, tell us about race relations and the things. I mean, because you speak from truth, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm picking up. You got facts to back things up, and you're kind of like me. Truth is truth, and you're willing to voice it. But as I know, and I'm sure if you didn't know, <laughs> you're finding out. Yeah. Um, how was how is your process? How has it been? 18 months. Summarize Fort Wayne's race relations. 
Well, you know, if we look at um, some of the data that we got from the race cards, what it really shows is that we've got work to do. Uh, we're fortunate that once we wrap up this project, uh, Fullinger Foundation is going to help Fort Wayne Urban League find an intern where they're going to collect all of the race cards and produce some kind of data. So if you call me back here in a couple months, I'll actually have data to show what kind of climate Fort Wayne um, City is sitting in. Um, we have work to do um, because when people feel comfortable calling me the N-word and using the N-word and their six words, that tells me that we're not there yet. Um, but there, but there is hope in some of the six-word essays that that we ha that we've received, and that's what we have to hold on to when we're doing this, you know, kind of work. It's the the story that the mom shared about all the boys at the movie theater. There's hope in that because now we've got an ally that understands, you know, what we're working against. There's always going to be naysayers. Um, there always has been. And so we can't focus on that. We've got to, you know, look forward and be concentrating on what we're trying to do to actually make things better for everybody. So, I mean, I, that's really what I have to concentrate on at this point. Okay. Yeah, you used the word powerful when you talked about your press conference setting off the race car yes. project. And, I mean, that was my adjective as yes. well. And, you know, you describe some of the leaders with, you know, people that might not know. It was very diverse. Yes. And you're talking, like you said, allies. But it was very diverse. And people said some, I don't know, I guess profound things yes. that, you know, was powerful is, is the first word yes. that come to mind. Well, it was. Yeah. I mean, I kind of had chills <laughs> after, you know, words because we had so many people um, and people that really wanted to do the work of what this race card project really meant. And they set the stage to open that door for the community so that other people would be courageous and brave to share uh, their six words. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was. I hope people go out to the website and, and watch it. It's exactly what I think an urban league should be doing in any community. Um, National Urban League was really proud of our work and um, sent out a press release of, of what we've been able to do so far. So that felt really um, good. But, you know, it's it's staying on top of that, that messaging and making sure that people understand that we still do have problems and we can't work on the problems if we don't acknowledge what's going on. So, you know, everybody keeps talking about what happened out southwest um, Allen County and Homestead and, and, and some of the, the issues that they've had but you know what it happens in every school every stu you know every classroom and it's important that that we that we have a dialogue around it yeah yeah you know the thing that always um is funny to me as soon as you talk again like i say you bring up race or you say uh implicit bias um people you know they mm -hmm. tense up but the reality is we all have it yes you know and i gave a group of people i said you know if i said Somebody was from, you know, this rural town in Indiana. You know, what's the first thing that came to your mind? You know, everybody laughed and joked. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, that's bias. You know, yeah. we, we, we all have it. But it's how you treat people and what you, you know, what you do with that information. You know, you may have that bias, but, I mean, you're not going to hold it against somebody. You're going to get to know that person and judge and see if they're capable to do that work, if they are that nice person. Um, you know. But it takes work, I mean, to get through some of those uh, biases, especially when you've had uh, real life experiences. So uh, we're waiting for the State of Black America's report to come out from the National Urban League March 1st. Um, but last year, it saw that we really had an uptick in um, hate crimes against black people. Um, and so if you're someone like me um, who grew up, you know, in the 90s, we had the crack epidemic um, I, at that time I was living in a home on Lewis Street. Um, I'll never forget the day that um, my first boyfriend um, taught me how to slow dance, you know, with a little dip in the, in the <laughs> middle. I didn't know how to do that. Okay. And um, our favorite song was uh, Pretty Brown Eyes by Mint Condition. And he taught me how to uh, do that little dip with the slow dance and um, always has been special to me. Uh, but a day that I can't forget is us standing out on Lewis Street just talking by the candy store and the police coming, swooping down. It, you know, we were with a group of people, but he ended up getting kicked and grabbed by the police, you know, was pushed down, 
on his stomach in the in his eyes looking up at me. I mean, he was shocked, he was scared, and there wasn't anything I could do to help him, and he hadn't done anything wrong. Um, when you have an experience like that, um, I, I don't think it's too far to imagine that when I saw a white cop, you know, I saw danger, I, yeah. I saw fear, I saw someone who could hurt me. Um, the flip side to that is uh, my brother lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and he's a police officer. I love him to death. He's doing really great work. Um, but it took me years to really kind of get, you know, over that fear. And I don't know if I've ever really gotten over it, you know, because it was that incident. But there were other incidents that happened uh, with police that weren't um, feel good uh, relationships. And so, you know, if a cop got behind me and I was in my early 20s driving, I got a little scared. You know, are they going to pull me over? Did I do something wrong? Um, so, yes, we all have biases. Um, it's all Always something that we should be working on, but when you have real time, real life experiences, it really takes work to get over it. Yeah, no question, no question. That's it. You're right. You're talking layers of layers, like you mm -hmm. said, personal experience. Uh, everybody was raised a certain way, so you know, if, if I was raised, my family told me X, Y, Z is the truth. So now you're telling me at 30 years old that that's a lie. I mean, that is. That, yes. That's hard for some people to, you know, to swallow. Yeah. And uh, and now the other big thing, too, uh, you know, what they call it, the misinformation age. You know, you're presenting facts. You know, it's going to be people, ah, oh, she done made it up. You know, they, they, right. they can make numbers say whatever they want right. to say. Um, so back away from, you know, making changes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And I'm guessing not, uh, just a little bit. Let's, sure. let's touch on the housing. Yeah. Because um, when we talk about housing and you brought up, that's one of the biggest uh, factors when we talk about mm -hmm. wealth, the gap that exists. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I actually, you know, I'm a loan officer. And so I'm in the, I'm in the business and I understand that I'm watching, you know, what's what's going on in, in, our, in our market. And that's one of the things. I mean, our housing, you know, right now they're not building anything under two hundred thousand dollars. Yes. I know. And when I see a report on the southeast side of Fort Wayne, the average salary is twenty seven thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what can they afford? Um, are you guys do you have anything on the horizon uh, getting the home ownership program start kick started back at their? Yeah, Lake? it's definitely on my radar, something that we have to do for the community. Uh, Fort Wayne Urban League is working on our HUD certification again. You know, we have to have that yeah. to really have a housing program. So we're probably about a year out to get that certification. Um, but yes, we, we want to work on that. Uh, we've had partnerships with Ruoff Mortgage where they've come and do um, just informational sessions for people to understand how to buy a home. But let's be real. If we're not working on what people are making, the wages, you're not buying a home. Uh, me personally, um, I shared a little bit about my personal story, but I didn't own a home until I married my husband. And um, his his home was passed down to him uh, through family. And um, so we're on Abbott Street, right down the street from McMillan uh, Park, and we own our home. But I own that home because it is a family home of my husband. I did not qualify to buy a home for many years uh, because of credit struggles, not understanding finances. When you start off at 18 and um, and you don't have a background of how to deal with money, um, you make mistakes. And unfortunately, uh, we you really can't make mistakes when you're trying to buy a home. You right. know, so part of this is really having a financial education education to prepare people to understand how money works, um, savings and all of that, but really get folks into good paying jobs. Because if you're making $27,000 a year, you're not buying a $200,000 home. Right. Um, and so, you know, we have to look at it from, from both of those aspects, I think. Yeah, that's exactly, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, higher wages have to be out there. Um, I look at all the development, everything that's going on. I mean, our downtown is beautiful. Um, with that, though, you know, so are the prices. You know, yes. it's like going out into Chicago where the big cities, you know, the prices are starting to catch up. And me knowing what some people are making, it's like, can they, you know, can they afford to come there on a regular basis? You know, it might be something you're going to do on occasion, but it's not well, look somewhere. Look how much people are paying for rent, JJ. I mean, even on the southeast side in the 06, we have homes that come up for rent for $1,500 a month. Yes. I mean, 
you know, that's what we're talking about. It's sad because someone paying $1,500 a month should be able to buy a home. But as you know, there's so many layers in that home buying process that keeps people out. Yeah, you're exactly right. And a lot of, like you said, is, is education. And I mean, even culturally, I mean, um, you know, we were always taught, you know, you pay stuff off. Um, you don't, you know, don't use a credit card, pay everything right. in cash. Uh, and then it could go back, you know, our elders uh, mistrust with financial institutions mm-hmm. and for, you know, for, for good reason in some, in some instances. Um, but just that education piece isn't there. And that's one of the biggest things, you know, when somebody walks through my door and I'm, I sit down with them and we're talking and it's like, man, I never knew that. Nobody ever told me that. Mm-hmm. You know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, you know, uh, I, I didn't know that. I, I, I could probably retire and uh, I, I can do uh, podcasting year round. <laughs> but what do you do? I mean, JJ, when someone comes in with that $27,000 a year salary and they want to buy a home, you know, Aisha, I'm telling you, that's something I've been screaming from the highest mountaintop. It is a frustrating feeling because which you can have somebody making 27,000 grade a credit. Um, like they said, they, they have no debt. And, and I literally have had these stories. I had, I had a young lady I went to do a financial literacy uh, education class at a church. And so the young lady who opened the doors for us and set everything up, she said, hey, pastor told me to talk to you after the presentation. And she came. She was making 30000 And she said, hey, she said, pastor told me, you know, you can help me. She said, I went over here to this bank, and this is all they can give me. And so... You know, we talked to it, and she told me about her credit was, you know, 800, and she didn't know anything. And I'm sitting, I'm listening. I think they approved her for like 120, and we got to talking. And I said, okay, now how much do you make? And she hit me with the 30. Mm -hmm. And I said, 120 is kind of on the high end, you know. And I Mm -hmm. told her, you know, a a quick formula, you know, type what you earn annually times it by three put you in that ballpark right and she and she looked and I mean those are stories I mean they do that will you know yeah. you talk about crying or just bleed bleed your heart mm-hmm. um it, it, it's tough and something's there's something's got to give mm-hmm. where there's going to you know going to need some assistance from the city some type of grant to kick in yes. because again con- construction costs are up there yeah. um the other part is you know with home ownership you got people what's going on right now that aren't leaving their homes that typically would leave their homes and downsize. But now these folks are in their homes at two and a half percent raise or three. You're talking about downsizing and getting less and paying seven percent, seven and a half. You know, it's like, no, yeah. they're taking that home equity and, 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 and using it to make improvements or whatever on their home. So now your first time home buyers, even the ones that have funds, you know, there's nothing there for them to get. Yeah. So it is. It's, 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 it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And, and, and something, you know, has got to give. But uh, we definitely appreciate, you know, the work that, that, that you're doing. And, um, you know, I feel very confident with you at the helm and uh, helping to lead, you know, this city and some of our, um, our, our communities that, that, that need it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with everything that you have going on. And again, back to that tutoring and any program that you have, <laughs> give them your web, give them the, uh, um, the, the website, website is www.fwul.org. Doesn't get easier than that. So look out for uh, neighborhood block club money. Look out for one-on-one tutoring, acting in art classes uh, for your uh, youth. We're going to have senior techie class coming up. You know, a senior needs a little technology training, send them to urban league. We're going to have band book campaign coming back. We've got the race card project. Uh, running on now and we've got some fun stuff coming in the the summer with a steam camp and we are bringing the urban league gala back to the community with a new twist september 7th we're going to have equality for all sneaker ball and i want to see everyone out there at the mural (laughs) center with those tickets to support our mission all right definitely and definitely keep us abreast and we have to bring you back on to help with some of that promotion getting, getting getting the word out um, what about the race car project? They have to what March first? To- uh, fe- we're going to wrap it up Thursday because that's the end of February. Uh, but March thirteenth, we're going to have an open house at the Urban League. Anyone in the community is welcome to come from ten thirty a.m. to one thirty uh, p.m. So on your lunch or what a- when you get a break, come on by. You'll be able to read all the race cards. You'll be able to see what was sent to us electronically. We'll have some beverages and things for you. Um, but I think it's important for people to see pen to paper what the community is really saying about how they feel about race. All righty. 
Aisha Arrington, Fort Wayne Urban League Director. It has truly been a pleasure. Let's help support her organization. Let's uh, get on and get on with the race car project. And I'm JJ Foster. I'm going to sign out our neutral voices, OMB. Oh,